be alive in us today. Father, we ask that in Jesus' name. We thank you and we honor all the time Alf puts into seeking you and reading and getting it alive in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, All right. Must be the day to honor because, you know, I've, I really felt like, um, before I get started into John 15, I just want to honor, actually, the seniors that are in this church. Isn't it wonderful to have a bunch of seniors in the church? Just, just so you know, we miss Fred and Sharon badly. They, they ministered last week as their last Sunday here, and they phoned us yesterday and they were at the Detroit border, and they managed to beat all those winter storms across the, across the U.S. and uh, got there safely. So they're safely back in uh, London, Ontario. And, uh, but I just, I just, I think we're so rich, you know, that we have, you know, Agnes and Fred and Marguerite and Ray and, and uh, Bill and Vi and, and uh, Reuben and Diane and... I, I hesitate, you know. How, how young do we go? And Jane. Yeah, and just, we're rich because we have people who have experience. And I shared last week about some of my heroes that I reconnected with, you know, or in their mid-80s and 90s, who were people I knew and were, were great influencers in my life when I was 20. And so um, we're going to see some of those preaching here in the next couple of months, and I can't wait, because these guys are awesome. 90 years old and still going, spending, he just, last guy, I probably told you this last week, but I can't help but brag a little bit. His name is Tom Tatico, and I've done mission trips with him before, but he just came back last weekend from two months in Brazil up the Amazon. 90. So, you know, as long as God gives us strength and gives us life and gives us breath, there's something for us to participate in. Right? All right. Ah, thank you, God. Well, we're going to go into John 15, and I'm, I don't know if it's, I'm blowing my ears out or if, am I really loud? I might get excited, so you might have to turn me down a little bit, but we're in John 15, and uh, we're working our way through the book of John. And by special request of Pam, I'm going to first of all give you a brief outline of John chapter 1 through 14. Because she specially requested it. Oh, oh, okay, all right. We won't do that. We'll save that for next time. Pam tells me I keep, I keep, I keep re-preaching all my sermons, but I, I shouldn't do that. John chapter 15, verse 1. All right. Jesus, remember, just quickly remember the setting from John 13 on, he has been talking to his disciples and spending time exclusively with them. This is the last few days before he dies. This is, he's about to be arrested and executed and so on as we know. And so John 15 is, you know, we, we always say that 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, the last things you say before, when you know you're going to die are probably the things you want everybody to to really know for sure. And so it lends extra, extra, you know, everything Jesus said was amazing and wonderful and words to build your life on. But what he said just before he died to his, to his 12 followers, to his 11 followers, I guess it was, and whoever else was around are very, very important. And so this is what he says in John 15. I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branch that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. I don't know about you, but when I have always read that all my life, and I've been a Christian most of my life, um, I've always felt a little bit negative about that. I've always focused on the cutting and the pruning and the, you know, and the, the, you know, the father doing this stuff that hurts and, you know, and all this. And it's, it's, it was just part of my early concept of God, that God was just waiting to constantly correct me and constantly show me what I was doing wrong and constantly, but I, I'm going to show you today out of John 15 what the purpose of the father's pruning is, all right? Can we do that? Uh, I want to talk to you first of all about there's seasons of growth, of rapid growth, 
And then there's seasons where things in our lives need to be cut away. And so we're going to use the grapevine analogy. And I'm going to teach you guys. Is there anybody here who's an expert at tending a vineyard? Anybody? Anybody at all? Richard, that doesn't even fall under your category? Okay. Richard is my go-to guy for horticultural, um, you know, information or encyclopedia. He, he usually corrects me later. But I looked it up on the, actually, on the Washington State University website. Uh, I guess they teach horticulture or whatever there. And so here's a little bit of information about pruning grapes. And you'll, you'll see the application as we go. It says here, don't be afraid to cut. When you finish, about 90% of last year's growth will be cut off. Isn't that interesting? In a vineyard, right? Now the reason is, <laughs> that sounds like too much. So we'll discover the reason as we go. But 90%, so when you see a vineyard that's finished for the year and it's being pruned in the winter, you'll often just see just the, you know, the vine, the main, the main stump or whatever you want to call it, and just a few little shoots, you know, off of it sort of thing. And it looks like, wow, they really went to town on it, but that's how grapes need to be cut in order to produce. Because you see, the father is interested in fruit. He's not interested in a vine that looks good. A vine that produces fruit looks good, but that's, his intention is not to look good. His intention is fruit in our lives. And so he cuts away things, as we'll see in just a minute, that are in our life that are hindering fruit from happening. Even stuff that looks good. I mean, we can easily say, well, we know, we, we, we can say we know what needs to be cut off, you know, all the bad stuff. But you see, God knows even the good things that are in the way of the best, that are in the way of producing fruit. It says here on their website that even if you make a mistake in pruning, it's okay because you can fix it. it, it vines are very vigorous. It's a very vigorous plant. It can overcome terrible pruning and it can regrow and you can fix, you can correct your mistakes even if you cut too much. So the point I get out of that is not that the father's going to cut too much, but that the vine is incredibly strong. Who's the vine? Jesus is the vine. So even if there's pruning going on in your life, the vine is what we're counting on. The vine is life. And we'll see that in a minute. So grapes bear fruit on the green shoots that arise from one-year-old canes. Stick with me now. Even though we're not, we may be growing grapes here next year or something. All the research I've done. But pruning, so grapes only grow on green shoots that arise from one-year-old canes. So canes that grow out this year are going to produce fruit next year. But canes that produce fruit this year will never produce fruit again. Every year, the, the, the one-year-old canes, when they're all done, have to be pruned off because they will never produce a grape again. Isn't that interesting? So things that produce fruit in our lives at some stage, even though they produced fruit, they may never produce fruit again. And so when God cuts something off, or when it seems like God is, is cutting something off, or is dealing with us in a certain area where, but I, 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 I've always been good at that, or, or whatever, or, or that's been very useful to me 20 years ago, and God says, but today... Today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. It's, God is always about today. He's always about moving us forward today into what will be fruitful. The old canes that produce fruit this season will never produce again. Another thing is every grape shoot needs 14 to 16 well-exposed leaves to properly ripen a grape cluster. The leaves are incredibly important in ripening the grapes. They're only there to help ripen the grapes. They receive the nutrient from the sun and so on, and they pass it on into the grapes, and they help the grapes to grow. Now, God is, God is or the vineyard, vineyard dresser, the vine dresser, needs to pick off excess leaves because too many leaves is not good. It's supposed to be, apparently, 14 to 16. And the reason for that is shaded leaves don't do anything. If, if, the, if there's a leaf that isn't getting any sun, it doesn't add anything to ripening the grapes. 
It's just taking up energy from the vine, but not producing anything. So a, a vineyard, a vine dresser will go along and pick off excess leaves. Even green, good stuff that looks good, we go, what? You know, it's, it looks really good. But the Father knows exactly how to produce fruit in our lives. You know, the branch is not, is not um, responsible for producing the grapes. The vine dresser is. The father is the one who puts the vine in the best place and the branches in the best place to produce fruit. So when, he, when he's taking things away, he's not being mean, you know, the mean person. He's, not, he's just simply putting you in a position to th survive and thrive. Right? We, we so often feel, ouch, that kind of hurt. Like, I used to do that. Now I don't, you know, I can't do that any, or whatever. God is not taking you off and putting you on the shelf. He's simply preparing you for how you will be fruitful today. Yeah. All right. So, thinning grape shoots er in the early stages eliminates shoots that are unproductive and provides light and space for the productive ones. It says to begin th thinning shoots as soon as possible. As soon, so God knows he doesn't want us off on bunny trails all over the place. Um, expending energy in all kinds of areas, too many areas at once. It even says, like, if, if, a, if a shoot has three or four clusters of grapes on it, they'll pick the extra clusters off and just have one. Unless the cluster happens to be really small, then they might leave two. So, fruit, even, as it begins to manifest, the farmer picks off. So that, the fruit that remains can grow up perfectly. I mean, that's the same. I grew up in a fruit farming area in the Okanagan, and, and you know, when the, when the apricots and, cher you know, and apples and so on and everything come out, there's far too many on the tree every time. So they go along and they thin. They pick them all off, and the ground is littered with green, you know, fruit. Why? Because you don't want a whole bunch of apples that turn out this big. And the, and the tree can only, can only support so many apples and produce nice, big, perfect apples. And so they thin them off, and the same with grapes. So the Father is in the process of positioning us and pruning us, not to hurt us, not to be the mean guy, not to take stuff away, but in order that we will produce fruit. And I'm focusing a lot on these first few verses and so on, just so that we understand the Father's heart in all of this, in, in his dealings in our life, okay? Just before harvest, the lower leaves, even the leaves that have been left, the lower leaves that surround the grape bunch themselves are removed. They're pulled off to expose the grapes to the sunshine a little better and to provide good air circulation around the grapes so that, because disease can come in if the grape cluster is all surrounded with leaves, stays moist too much and so on. So it's to, to improve air circulation and to prevent disease infections. Another thing, and this is the last thing about grape growing, so, you know, if you're taking notes, you know, this is your last major point. Canes, the new canes that will produce fruit next year, need to be looked after. They don't produce fruit this year. They grow out, and remember, grapes only come on one-year-old canes, right? So, the new canes that are coming out this year will not produce fruit, but the father knows they're going to produce fruit next year, so canes that are growing in the wrong direction, the canes are really stiff, you know, they're hard, and, and, and a little bit inflexible. The shoots are very flexible. You can pick them off with your hand. But the canes, if you, if you, if you broke them, you'd, 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 wreck the, you'd wreck it. It would just splinter, and it doesn't, they don't break off easily, right? And so the canes need to be carefully bent into position for fruitfulness next year. And even a cane that's growing in the totally wrong direction, apparently, according to Washington State University Horticulture Department, if you take both hands on the cane and carefully bend very gently, 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 just until you hear the fibers begin to crack, and then tie it there, and then you can, and then you can bend another section, another se until you have, instead of it growing helter-skelter all over the place, it... It is a hands-on, gentle procedure, not designed to break it off, designed to 
to situate that cane for a very fruitful next season. Isn't it interesting how Jesus uses the vine and the branches in producing grapes as a picture of our relationship to him and the Father's relationship to us? Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Where's the fruit? The fruit's on the branches. The life is in Jesus. The life is in the vine. The fruit is on the branches. And the Father is the husbandman. The father is the, is the one who's the farmer. Isn't that interesting? So there's a whole lot. The, the point that I wanted to make out of all this is to grow good grapes, there's a whole lot of tending that has to go on. There's a whole lot. If you didn't know anything about it and you watched a guy look after his grapes throughout the year, you'd think, man, this guy's vicious. You know, First of all, in pruning season, in dormant season, he's cutting off 90% of the plant and just throwing it away. You know? And then, you know, all of, all of last year's canes, those were such good canes. We got a bumper crop off of those canes last year. They will never produce again. And the father knows that. And so he prunes, he trims those away. But it's a, it's a lot, it's, there's a lot of hands-on work. And even the really tough stuff, when you're really feeling like you're in a tough place and the father is, you know, pruning something off of you and it's, a, it's not something that's just easy to let go and like a green shoot. It's a cane that, you know, needs to be, he's got, the, the cool picture I got out of studying this was that he's got both of his hands on you. And he's very gently, you know, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not extinguish. Very, very gentle, very fatherly, hands-on approach to getting us into a place of being fruitful. Let's move on. Verse 3. You've already been pruned and purified by the message that I've given you. You see, Jesus' teaching and training and mentoring is the Father's pruning process. It's really hands-on. There are so many things about our lives that need to be reformed and formed and shaped. And things, you know, like I said, we know early on when we're Christians the things that need to go. Like, you know, we need to stop shoplifting, okay? Please, people, when you're a Christian, please stop shoplifting, okay? You know, you just, you know, there's certain things that, you know, we just definitely need, you know. Am I right there, Fred? You shouldn't shoplift when you're a Christian. Fred agrees. I like that, you know. Somebody with that experience can agree that, you know. So, there's there's things that we know that quickly, just get rid of that stuff. You know, that stuff has to go. You know, that, that's not productive to anything. And then there's things in our lives that God, you know, even as we get enthusiastic about stuff and we want to serve and we want to get in and we want to jump in, God takes the, the branches that are bearing fruit, remember in verse 2, the Father prunes them so that they will bear more fruit, so that their fruit will be healthy. And so we've been pruned by Jesus' teaching, Jesus says in verse 3. And so... Um, the Father wants to bend us into the most productive position, the, the most desired direction for our growth. And so, here's something that, that comes up, for example. You could be very gifted in a certain area, in a good area, but proud. So what would the Father do? He wants to use you. He gave you that gift. He formed you the way in your mother's womb. He, made, he put you together fearfully and wonderfully. He made you with that gift. But the problem is, is that you're proud of that gift, and you just want to use it to get yourself exposed to, to, you know, to recognition and so on, right? So the father needs to actually prune good things so that they'll produce better fruit. You see where, where, where we're going with that? Jesus' teaching and training. Here's, here's uh, you know, just Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6 talks about uh, the Father's discipline. And, and we've looked at that scripture before. And I hadn't really related it to the Father pruning and thinning and so on. But, but it, it, it's actually the same action. He, it, the writer to Hebrews says, Or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children? 
My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves he disciplines. The child he embraces he also corrects. I just thought it would be good if we read the writer to the Hebrews is actually quoting Proverbs 3. And so the next scripture is Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. And it just gives a slightly different uh, look on it. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. The message says it's the child he loves God corrects a father's delight is behind all this. I wish above all that we could get it through our brain that God's work in our life is not to hurt us, is not to try to bring us low for some kind of satisfaction on his part of humbling us. His purpose is to produce fruit in our, in our lives. His purpose is that we be fruitful. His purpose is, you know, he, he only takes the time to discipline the sons. You know, a father's delight is in all of this. I wish we could see God's hand in our life when he's not just saying, I love you, here's a big hug, when he's saying, you know what, I really need you to look at this area because I want you to do this a little differently. And we go, oh, but if we could just see that his hand is in it to produce, if we could see a year down the road from his dealings with us today, we would embrace those dealings. And the older you get, the, old, the more experience you have with that, the more you actually welcome. God's dealing in your life because you know that he's trustworthy and he's good and you feel his delight in you as he's dealing with you. So Jesus' teaching and training is the Father's pruning process. Here's a scripture in Luke 22 that talks about the example I gave about if you're gifted in an area but proud. Jesus told them, in this world kings and great men lorded over their people yet they're called friends of the people. I guess they call themselves that. But among you, it will be different. Those who are greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and a leader should be like a servant. Who's more important, the one who sits at a table or the one who serves? Well, the one who sits at table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. Jesus always sets the example of how he wants us to live. He doesn't say, here, you know, I'm, I'm high and lifted up and, you know, whatever, and seated on my throne, and you guys just humble yourself. You see, Jesus came. He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for everyone, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so... In the kingdom of God, the pruning process of somebody who thinks they're all that, the, the cool thing is you are all that. But God wants you to do what you do out of a place of secure love, not out of a place of needing attention. And so, you may not even be aware of your need for pruning, but those around you certainly are. Is that safe enough to say? You may think, I am absolutely brilliant. When will somebody recognize my brilliance and promote me? Well, the cool thing is you are brilliant. But the Father is doing his work in you. He may be just taking that cane that's a little stiff-necked and a little bit grown in the wrong direction, and he's just with two hands gently bending you into a place where you will produce fruit if you give in to that process. And so you may not be aware of it, but those close to you do are aware of it. So even in doing good things, there's a training and bending. There's a, there's a thinning out of excess and su superfluous activity. How many know that doing, trying to do too many good things at once will help you only to succeed in doing nothing well? Right? So we always think, you know, in, in, with leaders and so on, we want people to do things, to, to work at a pace that's sustainable. Not to work at a pace where if I keep this up in three months, I'm going to be, you know, I'm shipping out. You know, I'm going to move to Bali or somewhere and live on the beach because I can't take this pace anymore, you know, or whatever. I mean, you know, anyone want to send me to Bali to live on the beach? I will take you up on that. No. Yeah, okay, you can come. All right. So... Looking good isn't even a consideration to the Father. I said it before, I'll say it again. A well-trained, well-pruned well vineyard certainly looks good. But that's not the Father's intention, looking good. The Father's intention is fruit. And so, 
Sometimes we can hear another example. We can hear a prophetic word from someone or get a sense in our own spirit about a direction we're supposed to take. And so we take off in the direction that we think would be the shortest route to that fulfillment of that prophetic word. How many people have had prophetic words over their life? Yeah. And in our heart we go, yes, tomorrow morning. This is it. At last, it's been publicly spoken over me. But prophetic words are God's indicating to us that he wants to work in our life toward a fruitful goal, toward a place where all of that will certainly come to pass. But he, the Father knows best, and he knows how to take us there. And often the way he takes us is not what we anticipated. Because we cannot, we can, out of our own self, we can only imagine that the best way to get to a destination must be the shortest route, right? The least amount of time, the easiest, with least obstacles and no stumbling blocks and no detours and no flat tires and no. And God says, You're tremendously gifted, you're brilliant, but your pride is in the way. And I need to take you in a process so that your gift can come out in all of its brilliance and produce fruit and produce life. So we grab prophetic words and impressions and we, and we consciously or unconsciously try to gain significance from them. Here's another thing, significance from a prophetic word, but right off the hop, if you receive a prophetic word and inside you have gone, oh yes, finally, just put your hand up, I need pruning. I need pruning. Our only source of true significance is what our Father in Heaven thinks of us. It's never what we do. If you never did one more thing, but stayed in your Father's love, you would never have more significance than you do right now. Doing, doing, doing does not give you significance. Only what your father thinks of you. It's not that we shouldn't do anything and we need to, okay, I got a good idea, let's just stop everything until we know 100% that we're doing everything from the right motive. No, that's not the way it is. The vine dresser prunes and thins things as they grow. All kinds of extra leaves grow. All kinds of extra stuff happens. He thins them out and he prunes them and he, he doesn't stop. Okay, stop. Let's cut the, you know. No. He prunes as you grow. You keep moving, you keep moving, you keep doing. And God, in the process of that, will faithfully prune you. We're, we're to be growing and doing things out of a secure place of our Father's love for us. Remember, Paul has the full revelation of this as he writes in 1 Corinthians 13. Whatever service, activity, exercise, you know, gift that you operate in in the church, if you don't do it from a secure place of love and out of love, how much does it wor is it worth? Nothing. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I have become as a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal which is kind of nice sometimes, but I think the writer is saying it's irritating. You just become irritating, even though you think you're brilliant. <laughs> so God is in the process of bringing out your brilliance. Ha. I feel really sorry for you. I, I do. I, I, I'll explain in a minute. I feel really sorry for you. If you have find yourself, consciously or unconsciously, striving for significance. The reason I feel sorry for you is because I know how it feels. I spent the first 20 years of my Christian life striving for significance. Striving, name dropping, trying to be seen as the brilliant so-and-so. And speaking whatever, whatever it was. Ah, oh, what an awful place to be. It took me a, a year or two or three of, of just being angry at myself after that just to get over. I feel like I wasted a lot of time. It's a good thing that the vine dresser doesn't look at our efforts or our life as wasted when we're trying to follow him. To the best of our knowledge, but we have the wrong motivation. And I feel sorry for you because I know how that feels. 
And I, and I just want you to come out of that place if anybody else is at all like I was and, and to a certain extent still working through. Like Paul, it's not like any of us ever make it totally. We're all in process, aren't we? I think we'll make it when we cross the finish line. But I just want to, I would like to pray for you later and just say, you know, let it go. Let go the striving for significance. You know that you're striving for significance when you can't cheer someone else on. I had a pastor share with me one time that he was sort of between churches and he was not going anywhere and so he said to me, I said, why don't you go to church? Like, come to church. You should be in church. I've said that to a lot of guys. <laughs> it's not always received terribly well. But I encouraged him to come to church and he said, you know, I can't come to go to any other church where I'm not preaching because whenever I do, I sit there and all I do is I think, well, I could do that better and, you know, his, his hermeneutics is wrong and he hasn't researched that properly and, you know, how, why does he use, you know, bad grammar and, you know, and his, his, his sentence structure, his sermon structure, he doesn't have three points and, you know, what's, and, and, you know, and so on and so on. He says, I just can't, I can't shut my mind off. I'm so busy comparing and I went, oh, I'm so sorry for you. The same happens with worship people, worship leaders. You know, they can't worship when somebody else is leading because maybe they're not as skilled as they are or whatever. And they're, yo, why did he pick that? Oh, that's an old song. Oh, good grief. Do we have to sing that one still? You know, and honestly, folks, we need to get over ourselves. We need to, we need to come to church. We need to come to meetings. Come to your home group to worship God. Yeah. To, it doesn't matter who's singing. It doesn't matter if they can even hold a tune. What matters is what's in your heart waiting to be expressed to God. Now, of course, skill helps us to focus less on, you know, glaring, bumbling errors and helps us to worship. That's why it's good to be skillful. It's good to work on your skill. But the point is, if you can't sit and worship, even though the guy up, even though you think you're ten times better than the guy up front... I need to pray for you because you are in a place where you're, you're, you're striving for significance. You're striving to be noticed. The other thing, the other thing to know uh, if your indication that you're in, the, in that place of striving for significance is if somebody else gets noticed and publicly recognized for something and you don't, can you cheer for them? When somebody else is preaching, can you say, yes, go for it, even though you could preach better? If someone else is leading worship, if somebody else is sharing a testimony, if somebody else is doing PowerPoint, if somebody else is running the soundboard, can you just cheer for them and bless them and honor them? If somebody calls somebody out and says, hey, you know, thank you for the seniors, you know, and if, if I left somebody out, is it going to bother you? You know, like... Honestly, we take our significance from our Father who is in heaven. God knows. Another thing is, God is not pruning us in order to get a bunch of work done for him that he couldn't do our, himself. Did you know that? That might be a revelation to some of you. Some of us think that God is, is this guy. He's got all his work to do on the earth, and he's poor, lazy people who are not doing enough work, and so he's pruning and pruning and pruning us just because he's, there's a whole bunch of stuff to do that he can't get done himself. I got news for you. That's not what it's all about. His, his goal is to change our motivation from striving to earn love or striving for significance, to just sheer joy of being able to participate in his business. His goal is for us to have sheer delight in what we do for him. So, verse 4. Now we're going to move a lot quicker. So, have faith. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for the branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. What I want to draw out of that verse is, when, when Jesus says, do this, that means we can do it. So when he says, remain in me, it's not, he's not saying, I as the vine will hang on to you so that no matter whatever happens, you know, we need to make our decision to remain in him. We need to hang on to the vine. Now, he will hold you sometimes even when you're, when you're faithless, you know, when you're going through tough stuff and whatever. But we have a decision to make too. He says, you remain in me. And that's how you're going to have fruit. 
Verse 5 and 6. I'm the vine itself. You are the branches. It's the man who shares my life and, in, and whose life I share who proves fruitful, who bears much fruit. For the plain fact is that apart from me you can do nothing at all. The man who does not share my life is like a branch that's broken off and withers away. He becomes just like the dry sticks that men pick up and use for firewood. Out of these two verses, I want to draw this. You have a choice to make. Do you want much fruit or nothing at all? I would opt for much fruit, in case you're wondering what the correct answer is. Okay? But the point is, you have a choice. It's not like, well, there's no fruit in my life, and so it's got to be the Father's fault because he's... No. You have to remain in the vine. You have to draw your life from... As you draw your life from the vine, you can't produce a single grape without being connected to the vine. You have a choice to make. Much fruit or nothing at all. Verse 7. But if you make yourself at home with me and my words are in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. Again, here's the, prov uh, the promise of answered prayer and, prov and provision when we are abiding. Just like the branch gets everything it needs from the vine to be productive and from the vine dresser, so we also... Um, our promised provision and everything that we need. Whatever we ask will be listened to and acted on. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Verse 8. When you produce fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Once again, the proof of discipleship is fruit. You say, well, that makes sense. But it's not saying you're a disciple. You know, if, if the, the proof is that there's fruit in your life, not that you're just saying it. Does that make any sense? You can say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, you have to, you know, I don't, you don't have to prove it to me, but you have to prove, you know, your life will be proved that you are a follower of Jesus if you're lining your life up with Jesus' teachings. If there's fruit in your life, it proves you are a disciple. So you can't speak your way into it. It's not a, uh, a word faith thing where you can say, I'm a disciple and I'm fruitful and suddenly you're fruitful. No, there's a process involved in it. Verse 8, fruit happens when you let the Father's love in. What is fruit anyways? Fruit, is it praying more, reading your Bible more, going to church more, tithing more? What, what is fruit? People. What, what do you mean? What? People getting saved. You bringing people to Jesus. I think that's a great fruit. A grapefruit? No, that's a... A grape. A grape fruit. All right. <laughs> woo, woo. Yeah, that's a good one. I tell you what is fruit in your life, too, is when you let the Father's love come in and tell you who you are to him and who he is to you, when you, when you let that love build in you an intimacy of relationship with God, which brings healing and restoration to your life, and then you experience the power of the Holy Spirit to transform your life, that's fruit. Because people aren't won so much by our persuasive arguments or our quoting scripture. They are won by and they are, they are drawn to God by the hope that my miserable broken down life, even though I am presenting as put together and strong and everything else, if inside I'm crumbling, all I want to know is there's hope for me. And how we get hope is when someone else tells me, I know exactly how you feel. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And so the fruit is progress in your life. So the fruit of the Spirit also, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, patience, meekness, kindness, self-control, faithfulness. There's about nine of them, in case you're wondering. Fruit is something that happens naturally when you abide in the vine. You can't produce love out of a place where there's no love. We're told to love. We're going to read in a minute. We're told to love each other. I can't make myself love you if there's no love in me. I can't drum up love myself. That's not how we're built. We're built, here's a very simple thing, why you're on this planet. You are made to receive love and give it away. Simple. Done. You cannot give away what you don't have. But once you've received love, you can give it away. All right. A couple more verses, and then we're going to close for today. Verse 9. 
says this, Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus passes on the love he has experienced from his Father to us. He loves us the same way his Father loves him. Amazing. Isn't that amazing? When you read that verse, just as the Father, how much did Father love Jesus? A fair bit? With everything he has. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain, abide, stay in my love. Verse 10, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. Here's how to remain in his love, by choosing to obey his commands. Oh, I knew it. I knew it would get to a list. Here we go. Commands. Here we go. What are the commands? Church attendant. You know, like, can, can we name them off? You know, like what? There we go. Love is conditional. See? If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Well, I'm not going to leave you there. Isn't that great? Here's how to remain in his love by choosing to obey commands. The next thing I want to get, the last thing I want to get out of that verse is that he only asks us to do again what he's doing. He says, just as I obey my father's commands and therefore remain in his love. Verse 11 and 12, and I think we'll end after that. But verse 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I wanted to get to this verse for the reason that we talk about pruning and this and that and it's hard and it might be painful and so on. But the goal of Jesus is to take the joy that's in him who for the joy set before him endured everything. What was the joy set before him? Presenting brothers and sisters to the Father. Providing the way for all of us to come back into God's family. That was the joy. But the joy that was in him, just the exuberance for life, the joy that keeps you going, not based on circumstances but, and, and things going right for you, but the joy that was in Jesus, he wants in you. That's why there's pruning. That's why there's things when you go, why are you, this seems like you're taking this away from me, God. He's trying to put joy in you. His purpose is joy. His purpose is not discipline for discipline's sake itself. His purpose is to produce joy in you. Why? Because we're supposed to be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen. Because we have something that's more wonderful than we can even imagine. But his purpose is to bring joy. His great expectation is that in teaching him these things, that his joy will transfer to his followers. Jesus' joy is transferable. Ha. Verse 12. Here's the commandment. Just, I don't want to leave you with wondering what the commandment is. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. What has he commanded us to do? Love. How? How has he commanded us to do that? Just as I have loved you. We'll go on to explain how that is in the next part, but you can read ahead if you'd like. Be a good idea for you to read John 15 a couple times this week and just sort of mull over these things and work out these things in your own life. Father, if I have, and, and where I have, resisted your pruning, oh God, if I've doubted your goodness, if I've doubted your, your, the intention of your heart to produce life in me, to produce fruitfulness in me, that, that the joy that you live in would become part of my experience. If I've doubted your intention for what you've done in my life, please forgive me. Please wash me from false concepts of why you do things and that, if, you know, not believing somehow that you're good all the time. Because his intention is for us to have joy. His intention is that we would learn how to love one another just like Jesus loved us. I want to tell you something. John, in his letter, 1 John, talked over and over again about loving your brothers and your sisters. Now, Jesus taught, love your enemies, do good to them who hate you, Pray for those who abuse you. He said, um, love random people that you cross paths with that need your help in the story of 
the Good Samaritan. But over and over and over again, his primary, like that's because love should, in, you know, cover all of our actions 24-7 eventually. But over and over and over again, his command is that we love each other. Not to steal thunder from John 17, but in John 17, Jesus promises that when the church becomes one and truly loves each other, the world will know Jesus. The world will see Jesus in the church when we love each other. What good does it do to love somebody who you see once a week, once a month, once a year? Should we love people who are, you know, out there and who have needs? Of course we should. And not neglect the primary thing he asks us to do is to love each other. Is that self-serving? No. It's bringing glory to God. It's bringing more sons and daughters. It's saying, I want, people are going to say, I want what they have. Why aren't people clamoring at the door trying to get in? And John's back there trying to keep him out so we don't get stampeded. Why is that? Because we are, have not yet been fully pruned into a place where we love each other so extravagantly and so completely that people can't wait to join what we're doing. I look forward to that. I look forward to the day when the people in Abbotsford are clamoring for the church because the church has learned to represent the unity and the love between us that Jesus asked of us, that, that the Father is working into our lives. Yes, we are to love everybody else. Don't get me wrong. But we are for sure to love our brothers and sisters in the family of God. Amen. Thank you, Father, for your word. We just love to go through your word and to just see how we can form our lives according to your word because your words are life. Your words are not law. Your words are life. Your words are hope. Your words are peace. Your words are security. And so, Father, it's our intention to change our ways if we have been drawing life from another source. And we have not drawn life from the vine to which we are connected. Father, it's our intention to change our attitude towards your work in our life and see you as the loving Father working on the child in whom he delights. We just want to embrace your work in our life, God, and welcome you to come and make us into the fruitful, brilliant people that you've made each one of us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.